four million years later. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast. This is a show where two old friends who grew up with the Transformers Generation 1 cartoon watch an episode a week in story order and then convene to talk about what they saw. Lifelong fans of the show never fell out of love with it, and we come back to talk about it from the perspective of how we engaged with it as children and how we feel about it as adults. My name is Jersey Drost. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... I'm Hoover. Just plain Hoover. You're not going to use Hoovertron ever, are you? <laughs> I guess you could call me Hoovertron. Oh, I not? <laughs> I mean, going back to the old days, that was like that's been like your handle on like various social medias, like going all the way back to MySpace, right? Yeah, back when the internet was still newish, and I was in college to talk about how old I am, I was like, okay, the internet is a thing. You have to have a name on the internet. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. will my internet name be? And I like came up with a couple different options, and I asked people what they thought, and I wound up with Hoovertron. Hoovertron. And basically I've had that ever since. There's been a couple deviations from it, but Hoovertron is commonly used by me on most social media. Mm. And while we're in intro town... This obviously is not an episode where we're going to be talking about a specific Transformers episode. Nope. Didn't you listen to last week's episode, gang? Last <laughs> week we talked about the Autobots that we've seen so far, and this week we're talking about the Decepticons that we've seen so far. But for those who missed last week's episode, why are we taking this break? Well, it seems like the first part of Season 2 didn't really have any new characters in it. But this next mm -hmm. part is going to be loaded with new characters at every turn. So A veritable parade. You know, we just thought we'd retouch on the old guys before we embrace the new guys. Yes, taking one last long look at all the friends we've grown old with over the course of 27 <laughs> episodes. And bid some fond goodbyes. And acknowledge the fact that some of them are still going to be around, but they're going to be bit players as we meet some new, exciting Decepticons. Tell your parents, kids, is always the refrain in the Four Million Years Later podcast. <laughs> okay, so do you want to just dive in and do it? You want to talk about some Decepticons? There's not as many. No, there's only 20 Decepticons that we've met so far. So let's start it off with the Decepticon Communicator, Soundwave. Soundwave, the tape deck, the dipstick tape deck. <laughs> to quote Braun. Yeah, what do you think about Soundwave? We've we've covered him a lot in the show, but like he's he's such a emblematic figure in the franchise that I feel like he even if we've talked about him before, he deserves like a, a careful walk around. I have always loved him. I had the toy. I always have been enamored with the design. Mm -hmm. I can't say enough good things about him. The mm -hmm. only negative thing I could possibly say is that Jersey's constant mentioning of him being a weirdo has started to <laughs> sort of make me think about that. Yeah. And yes, he is very unusual, very much so. But... I don't know. I I don't want to brand him a weirdo like some people would. <laughs> Just the very nature of him is very strange. You know, how he talks. He's got little people living in his chest cavity. <laughs> He's full of tiny men. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, I call him weirdo, but you could also call him mysterious, right? Yeah. I feel like that's like a lot of his appeal. I, I'll admit, I think Soundwave is, is super cool. Part of me rails against him just because he be, has become such an emblematic symbol of the Gen 1 Decepticons. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like there's there's much more interesting Decepticons, in my opinion. But like I get like just like characters like Boba Fett, like Snake Eyes, like the mysterious, silent, but kind of spooky and scary character. I get what, what the appeal is behind that. As a child... I remember staring at the toy because I did one of those like classroom trade kind of things and I had him for like, <laughs> a couple weeks. And I remember staring at his face saying like, the Decepticon symbol looks an awful lot like his face. Yeah. I wonder if somehow he's behind 
like the formation of the Decepticons. That was like the little child <laughs> fanon that I had as a kid. Did, I'm, I'm guessing you noticed it too. Yeah, I was just always like, why did they make the Decepticon symbol based on this guy who's not the leader? You know, yeah. it's not Megatron's face. Yeah. So that was kind of odd, but it was just like an, yet another unanswered question that we didn't have the internet for back then. <laughs> and we were all in parallel, fascinated and wondering about. I feel like the later iterations of the character, like the Transformers Prime Soundwave, kind of leaned more into the weird and scary aspect of the character. Yeah. For sure. But I do think, I suspect that the fact that he has friends and the fact that he is so bottomlessly loyal to Megatron has got to be part of the math that makes you love this character so much. Yeah. As I will probably say multiple times on this episode, I love it when writers write the villains to have non villainous traits, like they have friends or Mm -hmm. they are just not generically bad guy. You know, there are aspects of Soundwave that seem very noble. Mm -hmm. Not in a heroic Autobot way, but just in a, I'm taking care of littler people Mm -hmm. way. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. Almost fatherly, yeah. Yeah, he pets Ravage. Mm -hmm. And, And Megatron has like a degree of trust in him that he doesn't have in the other Decepticons. Yeah. So, I mean, just just the fact that there's those aspects on a team of villains. So, Mm -hmm. I appreciate the fact that they've done that sort of thing with a bad guy. That's that's a good observation. And some other Sunbow shows do the same thing, where they have some of the bad guys, like, a little less cut and dried. Like, you have Major Blood, who just screams Cobra all the time, right? You know what he's about. But then you have you have other characters who are a little bit like, well, like Zartan, who's like, well, I'm not really on anybody's... You know, I'm not, I'm not, you can't cast me as pure good or pure bad. I'm out for mm-hmm. myself. I just want gold. <laughs> <laughs> or is it, is it Lexor, I think, from Visionaries, right? Like, there's, I, I think that's the character's name. I have to go back and look, but it doesn't matter. The, the guy, the guy who was, used to be, like, a thief and a spy, and he's always against Arzon. Like, the, like it's a cop and robber kind of relationship. Mm, yeah. Where he's like, like, I'm really not super into what the leader's all about, but I'm kind of doing my own thing, and I just happen to be aligned with him. Like, Soundwave is very aligned with Megatron, but it's just like he's not just pure sociopath sadist. But like like Starscream is very much pure cut and dried villain. There's almost no redeeming qualities to the character whatsoever. <laughs> right. Whereas like Soundwave has things about him that like are more, I guess you could say relatable, right? It, which is weird because he's such a strange character. Yeah. He is a bundle of odd attributes all put in one character. So that's mm. that's interesting. It yeah. makes you kind of stop and think. Now, speaking of odd attributes in one character, let's <laughs> yeah. talk about those odd attributes, like <laughs> namely his cassettes. Yeah. So let's start it off with Rumble. Megatron, uh, I got news for you. Reflector will be back soon with a lab report. Well, we've talked about this before, how he's kind of like a younger version of Skywarp. He's almost like a preteen John Travolta kind of greaser character. There's a little bit of that to his personality. He's well, he's a street thug, right? He's like mm-hmm. he's like a, a street punk who's ready to pick a fight all the time. And I love that it's got that whole like little like the little guy who's like got a chip on his shoulder kind of thing about him. Mm-hmm. I love that he and the other Decepticons that will group with him are not necessarily like refined officer soldiers, right? They're, they're, yeah. they're really, you feel like Megatron picked them up in an alley someplace, you know? <laughs> it's like, do you like to hurt people? I love to hurt people. Well, would you like to hurt a lot of people from me? Yeah. How good is the food? It's pretty good. All right, I'm in, you know? Mm-hmm. You don't sell rumble on the cause. You sell rumble exactly. on the... Exactly, exactly. You sell it up? him on the carnage. Yeah. You know, he's he's not wed to the cause. He's wed to doing whatever he wants and shoving people and, and mm-hmm. creating a mess and laughing at it. You know, he's, yeah. just, he's just a punk. Yeah, totally. And and he is terrified of Megatron, right? And that's, that's the way... Mm-hmm. They do a good job of very subtly describing that worldview through the way they write him in that, you know, look, Starscream, Megatron is strong. He's merciless. He can't be beaten and you'll never be our leader. There's that line. Mm-hmm. But then there's also the fact that he loves to mix it up with the other Decepticons when Megatron's not around. As soon as Megatron's back, whoa, hey, how you doing? I'm stepping in the line. (laughs) And that's that's his worldview. His worldview is whoever's strongest gets to call the shots. And if 
I'm the strongest. Well, then there we go. I get to call the shots. Yeah, well put. I did have the toy. I had all the original tapes, just to get that out of the way. <laughs> I, <laughs> get it out of the I way. love him. He's adorable. Yeah. You know, I think Frank Welker brought a really nice sort of, I want to say cuteness to him. Yeah. Maybe that's too strong a word. But, you know, to portray a street thug as cute isn't the easiest thing in the world, but I think they did it. I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think that is part of the appeal of the character. I think that's why he's such a memorable... Because I, I don't... I mean, I'm going to be corrected by watching the episodes, but I just don't feel like he has a lot of presence going forward. Maybe he does. He's certainly a very memorable Decepticon, and I think part of it is is that combination of he's just cute enough mm-hmm. that, that he's likable and relatable, but if you really boil down what he's really about, he is a complete monster, right? He just likes to hurt <laughs> things, break things and hurt people. Mm-hmm. And, and that also leads leading back to Soundwave. It's like, Soundwave has affection for this guy? Well, yeah, this is, this is how messed up the Decepticon family is. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, he's a little thug who likes to mix it up, but he's my little thug who likes to mix it up. <laughs> so let's move on to Laserbeak. <laughs> I love the laser beak toy. I the of the cassettes, my favorite are the Condors. Mm-hmm. I think they look really cool. Yeah. I and I even the Gen 1 ones as as weird as the wings look, I just think they're so darn cool looking. Mhm. I love the fact that he's like a semi-sentient animal who talks in Morse code to Megatron and that like if Thundercracker walked into the room and jumped up on Megatron's shoulder, there would be problems. Right? But <laughs> <laughs> Probably for numerous reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but Laserbeak's like, hey, how's it going? And he flies right up and lands right on Megatron's shoulder. Megatron's like, oh, nice to see you. You know, <laughs> you you spoke about this in an episode, like the fact that Megatron came over the space bridge and Laserbeak and Rumble are waiting for him. And the mm-hmm. first thing that happens is Laserbeak lands on Megatron's arm and Megatron says greetings mm-hmm. to them. Yep. Glad to see him. Yeah. So it's like, what kind of privileged place is Laserbeak living in where Megatron genuinely likes him? As we'll see in the Transformers movie, unlike some of my other warriors, you never fail me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he knows the way to Megatron's heart. Don't screw up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He had like one instance of messing up where he was t- too scared to go do something. And then Megatron basically barked at him. And yeah. got him to do it, and ever since he's been <laughs> online, now yeah, you could say that. Well, that's just because only one time did they pay attention to the tech specs. Well, sure, but story wise, it comes across as like, okay, Laserbeak learned his lesson that one time, and mm-hmm. ever since he's been a perfect soldier. And so many times, Thundercracker, Skywarp, and especially Starscream have to get yelled at by Megatron, but other than that one time. You know, Laserbeak never requires yelling at. You know, he's like the A plus student who brings the teacher an apple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he is that character, isn't he? Yeah, like Megatron physically abuses a lot of his soldiers, but not Soundwave in the tapes. Mm-hmm. They are accepted for some reason, and that is also fascinating. Yeah, and I mean, I also love the fact that he doesn't talk. Like, he, he squawks and he mm-hmm. delivers Morse code beeps. That to me is fascinating too. That there's like the Decepticons who speak in other languages. Mm. So I agree. And similarly, let's talk about Ravage. Ravage, probably of the tapes, the most iconic. Would you say? Like when most people imagine Soundwave, they imagine with Ravage in the Bumblebee movie. We don't see any of the tapes except Ravage. Yeah, I would say it's a tight race between Laserbeak and Ravage. Mm. I really like him. I I guess I like him a smidge less than Laserbeak, probably just because, you know, Laserbeak flies and that's a little bit neater. But Ravage is really cool. Ravage typically is like, okay, there's humans on the ground. Go chase after them. Yeah, yeah. That's he's the human a lot getter. of what he's in there for. My favorite moment of which is when he smashes through Chip's front door. With yeah. chip in his mouth. <laughs> God, that's so good. I feel like we haven't seen things from his perspective as much as we have from Laserbeak. 
Yeah. So it feels like Ravage is a bit more a question mark as far as like his character goes. You know, we've never seen him get yelled at by Megatron like Laserbeak did that one time. Mm -hmm. I feel like Laserbeak is a little more, slightly more easy to figure out than Ravage is. Ravage is a little more close to the vest, I guess. Just because we haven't had a lot of situations where he shows any kind of emotion other than what he's doing. I mean, other than that one time, Laserbeak doesn't show any emotion either. But Ravage seems a bit more mysterious as far Mm -hmm. as his personality goes. Well, Laserbeak at least, like he goes, ah, ah, ah. And then we see Megatron like getting beeps on his chest. So we know like some kind of communication is happening. Mm -hmm. Ravage never makes it clear that he's communicating with anybody. He's just always doing that kind of of growl all the time. But you never get the sense that like anybody's receiving anything from him. He he always operates alone. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I can't think of any time in the last 27 episodes where we saw Ravage like operating alongside of one of the tapes, right? Yeah. He is very much a, hey, go off and do this thing. And mm-hmm. it usually involves, you know, going far away. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and if you think about it, like the tapes all have sort of like primary specialties, right? Laser Beacon Buzzsaw is long distance reconnaissance and mm-hmm. possibly sneak attack. Rumble and Frenzy are frontline on the ground. Go in there and mix it up with these guys. And Ravage is go sneak around the hallways and find little humans. Yeah. He's very stealthy. You know, he's hard to see in the dark. I think they even brought that up once. But yeah, his thing is a little different from all the other tapes. So it's nice that they gave them sort of slightly different tasks to always do. Well, this goes back to the whole like part of the fantasy fun of this series is that everybody has a specialty. Mm-hmm. You know, they have something they're especially good at. Everybody has a talent. <laughs> yeah. And I like him a lot, but I like him just a little less than Laserbeak, I think. So speaking of Laserbeak, how about Buzzsaw? <laughs> Haven't seen him very much. He's only yeah. shown up a couple times, but he's essentially Laserbeak Part 2. You know, yeah. Laserbeak, you're doing such a good job. We have brought someone on to help you. <laughs> And his name is Buzzsaw. You'll be his trainer. <laughs> and it seems, it seems very corporate. But Buzzsaw, you're going to shadow Laserbeak for a few right. weeks while you learn the ropes. <laughs> and then, like, yeah, so then Buzzsaw like, does all the attacking while Laserbeak stands behind him quietly. <laughs> yeah, Buzzsaw. You know, this was one where, as a kid, like I said, I loved the Condors the most. And I liked Buzzsaw visually more than Laserbeak. Mm. I thought the, like, the shimmery gold body was super cool looking. And... Mm. It fascinated me that they were like twin birds. And so like when he showed up in the show, I was always like, okay, well, let's find out what's the deal with this guy. And we never really learned anything about him. So it was one of those ones where as a child, I did a lot of like personal fantasizing about, okay, how is, how is Buzzsaw different? Well, he comes with Soundwave. Like he comes with the toy. So Mm -hmm. maybe there's something that like makes them like have like a tighter bond. You know, I don't know. It's just, it was something to speculate on. But yeah, we don't get a whole lot to work with when it comes to Buzzsaw. No, we sure don't. I mean, uh, to me, it's just like, okay, Laserbeak can't be everywhere at once. He's doing a great job. Let's make another one just like him. Mm-hmm. You know, I've talked about my fan in before on previous episodes. So go back and listen to that if you want to. Mm-hmm. But to me, Laserbeak did such a good job. They just wanted another copy that could do that kind of good job simultaneous to Laserbeak's good job. So it just. It was just a a good idea to essentially copy Laserbeak into Buzzsaw. Mm -hmm. Hey, Hoover, can we talk about Frenzy? Hey, I didn't volunteer for this geeky assignment. I want Skywalk's job. (laughs) Of course we can. He's the last of the cassettes. I want to hear you go on about Frenzy, because I know this is something, like when we were first becoming friends ages ago, you did these fan comics that you sent me, and it like it really it kind of explored like the like Rumble and Frenzy being like brothers, and like <laughs> kind of having like a lot of affection for one another, uh, and admiration for one another. Tell me about this. You know, they're identical, essentially, not just in looks, other than color. They have the same voice artist, even, and... Frenzy, it seemed like the first time Frenzy showed up, he was slightly higher pitched, but ever since then, it seems like they didn't really bother to do that. <laughs> it was so slight to begin with, it was hard to notice. Yeah. And when you think of, you know, street punks or toughs, stereotypically, they run in packs. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if you think of just one guy alone, that's more of a bully sort of stereotype. But mm. street toughs, they run in packs. So let's give Rumble a pack to run with. You know, here's mm. here's a twin brother to run around with. And some people go, well, they really should have used his, you know, tech spec powers and have him be able to make this awful sound. Yeah, I understand that kind of complaint, but I thought it was really cute that he's sort of a copy of Rumble and they can do things in unison. I Mm. just thought that was a neat thing. You know, Laserbeak and Buzzsaw, they do work in unison, but more often it seems like, okay, we need Laserbeak to do this while we have Buzzsaw doing this. Mm. Whereas Frenzy and Rumble, they tend to work together. And I like that Like, the first time we see them together, Rumble is avenging Frenzy when Frenzy's getting yelled at by Skywarp. So it, like, sort of establishes the the brother sort of relationship where they will stand up for one another, if need be, (laughs) against guys that are three times their size. (laughs) What's funny is my younger brother, the one who's immediately after me, I've mentioned a couple times in the show, and we had that kind of relationship where we defended one another against like bigger kids, meaner kids and stuff like that. So like that aspect of their relationship really felt right to me. Also, I like to, I think one of the things I've brought to this show is that I like to celebrate whenever the writers do something that like reflects what a kid's life is like. Mm-hmm. Which sounds strange when you're talking about a science fiction show about robots from outer space living in the on Earth four million years in stasis and so on, but but really there was like a lot of relatable stuff for children in here in that when your friends in a group in school and I went to a very small school right like 25 kids in my entire grade, that's pretty that's pretty tiny oh my by. Gosh. Yeah, right? Like, so, like, when I went to, like, I went to, like, a class A school later on where there, I think it was, like, 150, 250 kids in my grade, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm, like, in this city. (laughs) And then I find out, like, actually, that's still a small school. Like, what? There's schools (laughs) with multiple levels on them. What? (laughs) Just in comparison, I believe my first high school had about 400 kids per class. Wow. And by class, I mean, like, grade. Grade, yeah, like, grade 10 was 400 mm-hmm. kids. Yeah. So the, in, in where I went to elementary school, there was literally 25 kids in my entire grade. So we all oh knew each gosh. other. And so there weren't clicks, right? You can't have clicks when you have groups that small, but there were tinier like subgroups within that group. And what do you do when you're a kid? You mimic all the other kids because you're trying to figure out who you are and you act like the other kids. You dress like the other kids to a certain degree. It's so, like the fact that they do the same thing. I feel, I feel like that feels very true to like a child's worldview. Mm hmm. We're in the we're in the club. We do this thing. Yeah, and you know them being the, the smallest Decepticon robots. Mm-hmm. It's cute to see like them work in unison because you know they have to fight much bigger guys all the time. Mm-hmm. You know they're basically human sized, so yeah. they have to work in unison. Use those pile driver arms, which I think are really cool, mm-hmm. and they can bring down the bigger guys with those. And you can see that they get sort of a joy out of the carnage and. You know, I said it with Rumble, but I mean, they're very likable bad guys. I mean, some Mm -hmm. bad guys are just horrible, 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 and they're written that way. But these guys, you know, they're they're a little bit cuter. You Mm -hmm. know, they're very much like an evil Barbarino, you know, that (laughs) sort of thing. We should also talk about those pile drivers real quick, because in Mm -hmm. the tech spec on the toy of Rumble, I think it just said he had like tumblers in his chest or in his body that make the seismic activity. Like Mm -hmm. it it said nothing about him actually pounding the ground, right? Yeah. So what a lovely visual way to show what he's doing, because like they could have done something where he's like, I'm going to shake my biceps or whatever and it makes the ground rumble there's like gravity waves come off me or whatever right well i think in the original comic if i'm remembering right he just like danced (laughs) and used his (laughs) legs to do it oh man i might even be thinking about a coloring book but like they they were (laughs) using that power but in such a visually different way and that would have been a whole other thing yeah so like the the thing that i think both of us have celebrated throughout these many episodes of reflecting on the show is 
it tries to do as much as it can visually, uses as much visual shorthand to mm -hmm. deliver a lot of information. And so how do we make it clear that this, this, these little guys can make the earth open up while their entire arms turn into gigantic pile drivers, like gigantic relative to their bodies. So yeah. now we can believe that they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then they get used in so many interesting ways, like in the underwater fight with Hound at Sherman Dam, where he actually uses this pile driver to kick out one of Hound's legs. Yeah. So, yeah, Rumble Frenzy, awesome Super fun, super memorable Decepticon characters. A lot of affinity for them. And I loved the fact that the Masterpiece versions of them actually came with the pile driver arms that you could put mm -hmm. their real arms into. That was a great yeah. little addition. Yeah. So moving on to a similar character, but <laughs> a little bit older perhaps. Let's move on to the Decepticon planes and talk about Skywarp. Have a good time playing Crystal Nerd Screamer. Bye! Sky Warp, yeah. Who was the only Decepticon jet I ever got new. I got him for my, I think, 13th birthday. And I remember I, it was one of the few birthdays where I actually had a birthday party. And so I had like a lot of my classmates over at the house. And I think the, some of the boys in my class were like, they're at the point where they're like, we're grown ups now. Mm -hmm. We don't do baby stuff. So they're all like, they're giving me like the Top Gun soundtrack for my birthday. I'm like, that's nice. Thanks a lot. I don't, what's Top Gun? <laughs> <laughs> It's got to go sunglasses on. I don't care. And then my parents gave me Skywarp and I flipped out. I was like, oh my gosh. Because like, also, by the time I was 13, it's like Skywarp was old news. We were getting like mm. Transformers, the movie characters in the yeah. store. So, so this was kind of like, they, they must have got it on clearance or something. But like, they might as well have gotten me, you know, like dinner with Hulk Hogan. I was so happy. <laughs> I think my dad was a little bit off put by the way that the boys in my class were responding to that moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was just like, I feel like that was an emblematic moment that would like carry through the rest of my life of me being overly effusive about something and making younger kids uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> How could you not love this design, a black and purple Decepticon mm -hmm. jet? with that cool gold canopy. So he's got like one little splash of warm color amongst everything else about him is cold. He's got silver for like his shoulder bits. And then he's got purple gloves, black forearm or black upper arms, that cool black and white or purple and white uh, stripe going along his wings. Just the design screams like shiny leather. Don't <laughs> mess with me. You know, yeah, as, and as far as the characterizations go amongst the Jets, he's very similar to Rumble in that he's kind of a tough guy. He wants to push people around and, and get a kick out of it. Mm -hmm. But he's very loyal to Megatron. Maybe that's based on the fact that he got yelled at by Megatron in the past and he just doesn't yeah. want it to happen again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But one of the first things that we talked about when we met as sort of pen pals yeah. is that you were interested in the dichotomy that the Autobots were essentially not good warriors. And on the meantime, on the Decepticon side, Skywarp asked for permission to teleport. Yeah. yeah. So that was an interesting aspect of his character where he can, he, you know, he has these quote unquote magic powers that he can use but he's going to ask Megatron permission before he even puts them into use. Mm -hmm. That's a good sign of you're a good soldier, or maybe you're you're just afraid that you're going to get beat up if you don't <laughs> if you don't yeah. ask permission. Well, because yeah, because in Fire in the Sky, Megatron throws an Energon cube at Starscream's head and says, "You disgust me." Right. <laughs> Everything about this guy is abusive, and he is willing to humiliate and hurt any of his subordinates. If he's not happy with what they did, he's got a fire in the mountain. He punches Thundercracker off of a mountain. Yeah. And why? Because Thundercracker was protesting that Starscream was lying. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the first miniseries, one of the things that's so darn compelling, in the case that it makes for the premise of the story, is that the Autobots are always running off half-cocked, and Optimus can't mm -hmm. keep them under control, right? It's a, yeah. Ironhide's like, I'll stop him, flies off. Come back. He doesn't. Mm -hmm. Blue Streak's like, I'll get him. Come back. And then he <laughs> doesn't come back. You know, it's like, work with your people, Optimus. Meanwhile, the Decepticons, you have this almost knife-welding street thug in Skywarp, but he says, request permission to teleport. Permission granted, teleport and destroy, right? And so, yeah, I think like Rumble, if I were to you know infer a lot from very little material, 
Skywarp is a guy who perceives the world as it's, it's a power structure, and whoever has the power gets to be the boss. And when the boss isn't around, yeah, maybe I'll get in, involved in a bunch of like, little self-indulgent pain inflictions on the people around me. But mm-hmm. as soon as the boss is back, I'm right in line. And yeah, he probably got slapped down at some point or another the way Thundercracker and Starscream did. And now he stays in line because it is joyous to watch his other two fellow planes try to assert themselves and constantly get slapped down, as evidenced by Skywarp. <laughs> watch them see they do no further damage, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it also would be crucial to point out that we don't see Skywarp picking on Soundwave Nope. We don't see Skywar picking on Thundercracker or Starscream. Mm-hmm. We see him picking on the littlest guys. Mm-hmm. So that sort of makes him a generic, you know, street thuggy guy who's only going to pick on the people he thinks he can win a fight with. Yeah. And that's why it's so funny when Frenzy essentially reaches up and throws him into that computer panel in Frenzy's first appearance. <laughs> yeah. You have Skywarp picking on the little guy because he's, you know, he's a tough guy and it's it's going to be what he's going to do, but you know, he he only picks fights that he thinks he can win. <laughs> yeah. And he can't yeah. even necessarily win those. So that's kind of fun. That's pretty like typical for that kind of a thug character, right? mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Yeah, because there's 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 also nothing there's something very intelligent about them, but there's nothing especially courageous about them, if that makes right. sense. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and, and I mean I, this is something that I, maybe I should have put at the top of this one, but like I think this is something I think about a lot as somebody who writes for fiction for young people is that bad guys are a wonderful vehicle for us to exercise all of our bad thoughts in a safe place, right? Mm. Like. It's fun to role play through these characters and express and explore ideas that we would never act out in the real world. Yeah. Right? I don't think that my, because like we talked about in some of the very first episodes of the show, like as a child, I admired Starscream. I thought he was what courage looked like. Hmm. I never acted like him. I never kicked anybody in the stomach when they were laying on the ground, you know? <laughs> But like it was that that sort of self-assertion of I know and I'm here to tell you back down like that to me, it was like, wow, I wish I could be like that. And then, yeah, like there's part of me who feels malice and anger and like it would be cool to like rub somebody's nose into the way Skywarp does when Starscream gets reprimanded, you know? Yeah. But you just don't do that. So right. yeah, that <laughs> it, 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 that's. I, but so that's just to say is that like I I think that villains like really interesting villains like these are why we were so darn attracted to to them. Mm-hmm. And Skywarp was one of my first Transformers, so there's there's also that. Mm. I'm pretty sure I had him before I had a firm grasp of his character. You know, I don't know if I ever had a firm grasp of his character back in the day. <laughs> But black and purple are my favorite colors today, and I have to ask myself, you know, what came first, me getting Skywarp or me loving black and purple? I'm not oh, quite yeah. sure, because I was so young back then. Yeah, it's entirely possible that that was like an imprinting moment for you, and like mm-hmm. you're just like, well, now it's fixed. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Similarly for me in the color green, but not because of Skywarp. But anyway, but yeah, also just as somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about and teaching character design, everything about Skywarp's design communicates cool, slick, dangerous. (laughs) Why wouldn't little kids think he's cool? There's no reason not to. Now, the next guy on the list, I would say there's a lot of reasons to not think that he is, (laughs) is cool, right? Oh, you must mean Thundercracker. On the other hand, if I let you wreck our new weapon, Megatron might blame Starscream, which would make me very happy. Thundercracker, who is... He's blue, which is a cool color. And I mean cool in terms of temperature, right? It's like, mm-hmm. when you think of like cool colors, cools, cool colors are more introverted and withdrawn and red, red, like a warm purple, like a more of like, not lavender, but more of like a heading towards fuchsia, tends to be more extroverted kind of colors, right? Black and, and like a dark purple are absolutely the colors of mystery, right? Like you think about mm-hmm. color, purple, purple is the color the wizards wear, you know? And you see it in character design all over the place, like in Voltron Legendary Defender. What color are the Galra? They're purple. What colors are technology? Purple. When the black lion flies to form Voltron, what, what color trail comes out of him? Purple, right? <laughs> Why? Well, spoilers. His origins have to be, they happen to be tied to the Galra, you know? So it's, you got black and purple on a guy, instantly super slick and cool. Thundercracker is kind of red, white, and blue. (laughs) 
<laughs> and he's a bad guy. You know, like he's got the red and white stripe on his wing. He's mostly blue and his uh, chest bits are silver. Yes. Yeah. So in the toy, his shoulder vents are silver. And in the cartoon, mm. I believe they're white. So, yeah. yeah. And plus the animation model is a much lighter blue than the toy. I wondered if they did that intentionally because dark blue was a little too close to black mm. and they were already going to have so much trouble differentiating the jets from each other. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if maybe they, they were like, let's, let's lighten that blue a little bit and make it more distinct. Yeah, so now we have like this light blue guy with white bits on him and then red stripes on his wing. So like everything about his look suggests like well, not quite as evil, certainly mm -hmm. not as dynamic and menacing as Skywarp. And so they cast him perfectly. And I don't know, we weren't there. I wonder how much Wally Burr was thinking about that when he was looking at him or how much of it was just pure instinct, right? Like you look at the mm -hmm. Thundercracker, it's the same model, but just different colors. And suddenly he just, he seems not as intense. And character-wise, I mean, here's a guy who is basically just like old grumpy guy. You know, that's, mm -hmm. if you want to stereotype <laughs> Thundercracker, that's basically what you get. Yeah. And I like that. Again, you know, when all the villains on a villain team are just, you know, when you can feel that they're the same, like, palladium alignment. Yeah. When they're all, like, like aberrant evil or whatever D&D <laughs> alignment would be, that's boring and plain and meh but all these decepticons you know they they run the gamut in their personalities and thundercracker we don't get the sense that he thinks that what the decepticons are doing is the super right thing and in other continuities they've definitely played with that but here this is his job and he's doing his job. You know, he never really gives the impression that he thinks Megatron is the greatest leader or even the greatest robot ever. You know, we don't really get much of a sense of why he does what he does. He's just mm -hmm. an old guy. We get the sense that he's been around a long time. He gives mm -hmm. Megatron sass in one episode. One. It almost feels like he grew up with Megatron so he has sort of that in where he can sass him a little bit but you know if if Skywarp dared do the same thing to Megatron that Thundercracker did that one time I feel like Skywarp would get <laughs> shot out of the sky but Thundercracker you get a little bit of a pass because you and me go way back uh, you uh, know it kind of feels like that and of course I'm reading into it well, yeah, that's all we do in the show. But mm -hmm. yeah, I also get like a vibe of what's he going to do? Fire me? Kind of like he's, right. he's that he's that coworker who's been there 25 years. Like, look, I pff, I'm so close to retirement anyway. <laughs> 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 what's he going to do? Really? What's he going to mm -hmm. do to fire me? I Yeah, I, I'll go retire. You know, I'll go to Paradron and just be drinking uh, John <laughs> coolers for the rest of my life. You know, so yeah, he's got kind of that like tone to him too. The grizzled old guy who's kind of like half, his one foot's out the door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it, we don't, we, we got a, like only a little bit of information about him and it's some of it's conflicting information because then we have like Countdown to Extinction where he's like trying to keep the Decepticons operating when they think Megatron's yeah. dead. Yeah. So. And that was certainly an in interesting episode to come across. It's almost like I feel like he's been doing this for a long time and he doesn't know how to do anything else. So he mm -hmm. just keeps doing it. He's one of these people who's been in a job for years and, you know, someone else may come up to him. It's like, hey, why don't you go get a different job? I, I, you know, I hear you complaining a lot, but they don't know anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like he's always been in the army and he doesn't know any other lifestyle. So this is just what he does, and he does a good enough job to stick around, but not necessarily an A-plus job. Like, I don't think Megatron's giving him A-pluses on his Decepticon right, report card. Right, right. But... He gets cost of living wage increases, not merit yeah, wage increases. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he's always getting, like, B-minuses and C-pluses, but yeah. it's just enough to not get fired and not get promoted to any you know, respectable rank, you know, he, yeah. he's just there doing the bare minimum. I think that's a good metaphor for what role he plays in the show. And I, I think for sure we don't see much more of him going forward. So, yeah, 
a fond adieu to you, my dear Thundercracker. Although mm-hmm. you have a couple shining moments coming up in some f- future episodes, but not many. But uh, love John Stevenson. Love his performance. Oh, yeah, all his me characters. too. Yeah, I, I can't forget to mention him. You know, I just love that gravelly sounding voice of his where it's mm-hmm. like, you know, you hear John Stevenson on so many other cartoons from that predate Transformers. You know, he's on mm-hmm. Flintstones and he's, you know, he's on a lot of old timey cartoons like that. Mm-hmm. And so to get him onto a, a show like this, really fun. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. Okay, well, we got one more jet to go. I think that brings us to uh, a very obscure character who doesn't get much (laughs) screen time. His name is Starscream. I I feel like you need to, like put a cut of Megatron yelling his name at this point. <laughs> Starscream! Soundwave, go do that thing. Starscream! <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm sorry. I just hate you so much. <laughs> just saying your name puts an acrid taste in my mouth. Oh. <laughs> Starscream. Yeah, you know, kind of a fundamental piece of a Generation 1 episode. If you want to talk about that platonic ideal we talk about on this show. So much so that, like, he makes it into episodes well beyond his death, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not even death could keep him out of episodes. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, and I feel like the relationship and the tension between him and Megatron, it's it's such an easily definable and easily identifiable element of what makes this show so memorable and appealing that it gets replicated across so many different iterations of the series, right? Mm-hmm. We even, in the first season of Beast Wars, have that kind of relationship between Megatron and Pterosaur yeah. to a degree. Yeah, very much so. But... It's the one, it's the, that relationship is the one that I think, like, it's something I watch for in later iterations to see how do they find a new way to look at it. And I feel like Transformers Animated and Transformers Prime did a really good job of reexamining that relationship and finding a new angle that we never th- saw before. But what is that angle, right? It's like every time Megatron leaves the room, Starscream claims he's in charge, right? <laughs> yeah, as we've seen in a few episodes... Starscream always has the motivation to lead. Mm-hmm. And I would even postulate, if you've been listening to all the prior episodes, I would postulate that that's one of the few reasons Megatron keeps him around. Mm. Because in Megatron's absence, the other Decepticons didn't do much at all. <laughs> you know, without you know Starscream to boss them around, they were content to just sort of like sit at home and clean up the base and suddenly they became like maids, <laughs> you know, that, that was their, that was their only motivation is like, well, the base is messy. Let's clean up the base. Starscream, when he thinks Megatron's dead, he has them out raiding energy plants and stuff. You know, he's keeping up the status quo. So you could say that he's interested in doing the things that Megatron is doing. But, of course, Starscream wants them done his way. Starscream always has little comments if he has any issues with Megatron's Mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. But none of the other characters really have strong motivation to be leader. Right. So it's almost like Megatron needs Starscream to continue the Decepticon ideal. Because all Mm -hmm. the others are just... All the others are just too, eh, whatever. You know, they, they don't have that oomph in them. They don't mm-hmm. have that desire or pressing, overwhelming feeling to accomplish things. All the right. other Decepticons are me. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're either afraid of him or they think he's awesome. And so you don't get... The dynamism of creativity gets stymied by, like, limitless praise. And, and, and I, I'm being serious about this. Like, this is something I've actually ha- had happen with students where students take my class and they have existed in a world where everybody's told them that they're amazing. And so they mm-hmm. show up and they're terrified of sharing their work because what if it's not? What if they fail? 
They've mm -hmm. they've done nothing but win. So now failure is this weird abstract monster that exists off in the distance. They don't want to know anything about it. You know, I've encountered the student enough times that I actually have a like a not a procedure, but sort of an approach that I use to work with them to make them understand that like mistakes are the way to learning, and mistakes are the way to growth, and failure is the way you learn, like how you level up. Mm. And so I think you're right, is that like, who knows how much of this was done intentionally or not by the writers. We, we can only speculate and speculation doesn't get us very far when it comes to like analyzing real life stuff, but analyzing this made up story, we can come up with whatever answers we want, right? Yep. And so, yeah, there's no, there's no dynamism without a contrarian voice. And at different times, Megatron has reacted very differently. Sometimes it's like, don't push me. <laughs> then other times, <laughs> it's like, all right, this is it. I'm going to kill you this time. Please don't kill me. Yeah, I'm going to kill you. You know. And again, you know, it's like I've said before, it's like if all the villains are on the same page, it's a little bland. Mm -hmm. So if there's one guy always coming up with a different plan or finding holes in the leader's plan, you know, that's automatically more interesting. Yeah, and I could see like somebody make a story where like Megatron confides in somebody that like, yeah, look, he's got good ideas. He calls me out on stuff. I just can't let anybody see me tell him that he's right. So even yeah. when he's right, he's getting hit because he's got to in order for the other guys to stay in line. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you just made a pretty compelling case for why he would keep Starscream around. Because that was one of the things that as a kid, I remember thinking like, okay, how many times is he going to let this guy off the hook? Right, You know. yeah. But Starscream many times is correct, you know, when he held up that rock and drilled it with a drill and said, if we drill too far, the world will explode. <laughs> uh -huh. Your solar needle is probably a little bit dangerous, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And then, like I said, as a kid, he was probably my favorite, certainly my favorite Decepticon as a kid, possibly my favorite character for at least some of my childhood when watching the show. I loved Starscream. When we get to the episode Starscream's Brigade, I remember th that feeling like really triumphant for me as a child. Like he finally wins, you know? <laughs> and I coveted the toy like crazy. I thought he, the the toy was like Bob Odiansky inferred exactly the right personality when he was writing that file card because you look at him and he's like this sparkly silver with well he has red white and blue but unlike thundercracker who's coated covered mostly in the cool color starscream's in the sleek shiny silver color and silver is an interesting mm. color because it's reflective and it's showy you know whereas blue is more withdrawn and, and turned in so everything about him looks like he just walked out of an Ivy League school, like, you know, and he should talk with a Harvard lockjaw, and he would certainly think he's the most <laughs> handsome of all the Decepticons, which is what his file card said, you know, and I remember reading that as a kid being like, oh, he thinks he's, that's right, certain Autobots and Decepticons could probably, like, have different standards of beauty, and he would think that he is especially handsome. Why wouldn't he? <laughs> and and he is, he's a cool-looking jet, right? Yep. That's yeah. undeniable. Yeah, of all the colored jets, he looks the most real world, you know. Mm. It's like when Top Gun came out, you know, we saw these grayish silver jets, you know, we mm. were used to seeing that color. You know, it's like, how often have you seen a black and purple jet? You know, probably mm -hmm. not very often. Yeah. But, you know, Starscream looked more real world. And for some reason that made him stand out a little bit more in comparison to a blue or black one. Well, and he had more colors overall than the other two digs. He has like those red, the red intakes, whereas on the toys, mm -hmm. at least, Thundercracker Skywarp had the silver intakes. And then he's got the, the, the blue gloves, blue feet, red, red stripes on his wings and on his blue tail fin wings. Overall, he looks like he has more of a ensemble on him, right? He has mm -hmm. a look that he put together. Whereas like Skywarp's like, well, what's your look? Why dress all in black? <laughs> Thundercracker, what's your look? Well, I put on this blue jumpsuit because it was in the garage. <laughs> Starscream, what's your look? Oh, well, you know, it's it's Doshe or whatever. Make up some like European sounding name. <laughs> so And Starscream was the second Decepticon plane I got, and eventually I got Thundercracker as well, as I've documented before. So yeah, I had all three of them. I had to wait until the twenty fifth anniversary releases to finally get all of them. Mm. So Yeah. It was a long time for me to finally own my own Starscream. Especially for someone who loved him so much. Yeah, yeah. So, so, let us not forget Reflector, who did not get a toy until a mail-in version much late in the game. There, that was the last bit of info I needed. Stealing the anti-matter formula is gonna be a piece of oil cake! 
I've basically told you guys how I love Reflector. He's weird. Mm-hmm. He's unusual. Why does it take three robots to turn into the smallest alt mode? Yeah. You know, there's all these questions. You know, I, I've i sort of said my piece on Reflector, honestly. It's like, he's a character I shouldn't like, but the Chris Lotta portrayal goes a long way. The fact that they had them all speak in unison was weird, but also neat. Yeah, I feel like he's a character that points to a kind of whimsy in the early episodes that slowly fades as it goes on, as the series starts to take its, its shape and they figure out what transformers as a, as a property is the imaginative whimsical kind of weirdness of, you know, yeah, the three robots are turned into a camera. Why would they turn into a camera anyway? Well, because we got the toy, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, can't they take pictures with their minds because they're robots? Nope. They need a camera that actually makes a Polaroid. What? Right. You know? <laughs> Well, if there if there's three of them, how do they behave? They have different personalities. Do they argue when they combine? No, they operate with a singular personality and they talk in unison <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Like that kind of oddity, I feel like makes the first I want to say like tw- ten to thirteen episodes probably the most exciting in terms of promise. If that makes sense, like I'm always looking for what is it promising to do, and you don't have to deliver, just promise. And there's a lot in there. But by the time where we are now, the series has started to form into, it's, it's finding its rhythm, it's finding its stride. And so this kind of out-of-the-way weird character just doesn't belong there anymore, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, do, I do mourn that a little bit, because I would, I, like in some of the later iterations of the series where we get like that weirdness throughout... And even though everything else is fully formed, like I'm thinking of Blitzwing from Transformers Animated, right? It's never explained why he is that way, but man, does he bring like a new flavor to the show? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So it doesn't appear a lot, but I always appreciate when he shows up. Yeah. And yeah, I have to echo what you said. I mean, it's very weird and maybe a little too weird. Maybe that's why they did away with him, but I'm glad, I'm glad he got in there. You know, it's almost like the door was closing behind him and he just sort of snuck right in. (laughs) It's like, hey, I'm going to be in the show. It's like, oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, you're on Thundercracker shift. (laughs) (laughs) You know, again, any time a villain can really stand out from the villainous hoi polloi, that's a good job, in my opinion. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, moving on to the Insecticons. Let's talk mm. about Bombshell. This is no illusion, Autobot. <laughs> Prepare for termination. Bombshell. Creepy little weirdo. <laughs> I I love the design of this toy. I only had one of the Insecticons, and Bombshell was not him. But I, we've talked about this before. I always had an affinity for any Transformers toy where the face of the robot is absolutely concealed in its vehicle mode, you mm-hmm. know, because like there's the wind charger thing where it's like, well, he just lays on his belly and yep. curls up his legs behind him. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, okay. But if he jumps over a ravine, cause we're going to Duke boys all the time. That's what we do. <laughs> everybody's going to see his face. <laughs> you know? So like, like the fact that his face gets completely covered was like a cool thing. And I loved how he, he's the only Transformer I can think of that has like the, the mouth guard, but it's got like grates in it. Mm. It's a unique look. Yeah, I, I think if I remember, no, his waist does not turn. His waist does not no. turn. So yeah, he, he doesn't meet that criteria for me. But <laughs> And then Michael Bell's performance, right, is, is mm-hmm. really good. Like he gets the character right away. Like Bombshell doesn't change throughout the series. Yeah. Yeah, he is a creepy guy. I mean, all the Insecticons are creepy, but he's definitely more creepy than Kickback. Possibly mm. more creepy than Shrapnel. Possibly, uh, yeah. He has a great voice, but as we've seen, you know, he has special attributes where Megatron invited him over to the base recently. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hey, I got this ninja robot. Could you think you could make it, you know, do some cooler stuff? <laughs> In so many other instances, we've seen Megatron just fed up and irked at the Insecticons and basically... Basically, he abandoned his fight with the Autobots to go destroy the Insecticons, and apparently mm. that didn't happen. Yeah. So now he's, you know, suddenly inviting Bombshell over to the base to fix up his new little girlfriend. 
And <laughs> I just like, I would like to imagine that, that phone call where it's like, you're never going to believe this. This human scientist made this robot with knives and size, and he did it for peaceful purposes. And they both <laughs> laugh. They roar with laughter. And he's like, yeah, can you fix it? And Bob's like, can I fix it? I'll be right over. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know. I tried to kill you that one time, but hey, I got this really cool project. Do you want to work on it? <laughs> <laughs> Talking my language, Megatron. I'll be right over. Yeah, yeah. So like, it's they're like freelance contractors, right? Yeah. They, and and we've talked about this before too. Is like it's the whole idea of the Insecticons is fun because they're not out for anybody. They're just out for themselves, and mm-hmm. that means like they're nasty by disposition. So they're probably not going to reach out to the Autobots and vice versa. But I imagine that if like Wheeljack Kane was like, "Hey, look, I got this project. I really could use some expertise on." They'd be like, "Well, what's in it for us? Five Energon cubes." Well, I'd say that's pretty good, and they would do it. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, clearly they're anti-Autobot as they showed in their first appearance. They did remember that they were Decepticons, and they didn't like Autobots. But yeah. you could probably come up with an excuse for them to work for them if you needed to. Mm-hmm. Because they're they're just so independent. Like Bombshell says, I love warping minds for you, Megatron. You know, he's there that instance because he likes doing what he's doing in that episode, not yeah. for the greater Decepticon cause or anything like that. Right. Right. Yeah. And as, as a freelance artist, I can definitely relate a lot to his worldview, not about the warping minds, but about like the neat thing about being an independent contractor is you get to do the work that you find interesting. You get to say no to the stuff you don't mm. want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that rings true for me. And and then also like the the weird the thing was like is Bombshell the leader of the Insecticons or is Shrapnel? It's not clear. Mm-hmm. It seems like they're kind of interchangeable. Yeah, it feels like whatever you know whatever the mission calls for. Like, is this more of a kind of thing that Bombshell would like, or is this kind of more of Shrapnel's territory? Is it's almost like you know there's just three guys. They don't really need a set leader. You know they're gonna do whatever needs to be done and allow the person more involved with it or more more experienced with it you know handle it and i i don't imagine kickback is experienced in a lot of things so he probably doesn't take the lead on a lot of these i think he's more of the just just there to be involved and eat yeah sort of personality which yeah. i might identify with a little bit <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Bombshell, you know, when it comes to warping minds or using his cerebral shells, he may step up and call the shots, but in other situations, might be Shrapnel instead. Mm. So speaking of him, what do you mm-hmm. think about Shrapnel? Food approaches. approaches. Oh, well, this is the other Insecticon that I coveted because, once again, his face can be completely concealed, which is super cool. If I remember right, his waist does turn around. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the one I was thinking of where I was like, when I saw the toy, because I kid at school had it, I was like, oh, he is cool. I love things about the voice performance. Uh, we should say this about all the Insecticons. I love the vocal processing they do on them to give them that weird little, like, crinkly hiss and sort of, like, resonant, like a tingly resonance to their voice, more so mm-hmm. than the other characters. They have Their voices have a unique sound, just like how the Dinobots in the season one have, like, a grumble and gravel to all of their performances. Yep. I like that these sub-teams had different processing put on their vocals. But I love the performance of the character, how he has like this, these weird vocal tics where he says the last word twice. Mm-hmm. I love that so much. It's like so random. Like, why yeah. would you even come up with that? Yeah, it feels like completely arbitrary, but it mm-hmm. does so much to make him seem weird. And yeah. the fact that his, his voice is such a high pitch is weird and kind of creepy. And then the fact that he has so many abilities, he is so versatile as a Decepticon, it's like... Wow, if only you were driven. Like, if you were a mm-hmm. mission-driven Decepticon, you would really be a terrifying villain. Yeah. So I also love that. I love the idea of somebody with a high degree of mastery who punches out of the game and says, you mm-hmm. know what, I'm happy living in my swamp. I've got grass to eat. I don't, I don't yep. need to have lofty aspirations, you know? Yeah, especially on a team where the leader, and by team and leader, I mean Decepticons and Megatron, 
you know, Megatron is power hungry. Mm. Megatron is always after something. Megatron is not content to sit at home. Shrapnel, completely content to sit at home. <laughs> completely yeah. content to sit in a swamp for years. Yeah. We don't really know when they woke up, but we get the sense that they've been in that swamp for a long time. And they probably haven't ventured out far from home because there's there's things to eat there. You know, if you live right next to a grocery store, you know, you're not really incentivized to go into town very often. Mm -hmm. No, and and as somebody who is very mission driven, you know, in the sense that I work for arts advocacy organizations and a lot of that work is kind of thankless administration. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It can be frustrating sometimes to encounter artists who are less mission driven. But like Mm -hmm. then I look at characters like Shrapnel and I'm like, I get it. I get it. Like, cause like from, from my perspective, I'm like, you have such a high degree of mastery you have so much skill. Just imagine if you applied it to the common good, how much good you could do. Mm-hmm. But, but I also get their autonomy, right? That they're, they're a person, they get to make their own choices. And I like that shrapnel, <laughs> shrapnel does something that I don't, don't do as well as he establishes boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, you don't call me on the weekends. I'm going to be over here. I'm doing my thing, you know, like, <laughs> but the mission, I, I don't care about the mission. You know, I'm, I'm living in my house. I'm happy. So, <laughs> and speaking of living in a house and being happy, let's talk yeah. about kickback. I'd say that's pretty good. <laughs> that was my first Insecticon toy. Eventually, I got all three, uh-huh. but he was my very first, and that goes well with me because I too am very content if you just leave me alone with food. <laughs> The toy looks great. He has a terrific looking robot mode and his, his animal mode is really cool looking too. I love the fact that his forearms split into his insect legs. Mm-hmm. It always bummed me out though that his face was looking at the ground when he was in grasshopper yeah. mode, you know? <laughs> but if any character had that, it sort of makes sense for it to be like a weird insecticon because they're already weird to begin with. Mm-hmm. Like if someone like Soundwave had it, it would just be like, why is that? You know, mm-hmm. that that would feel dumb but for kickback to have it it's almost like it's less of a transformation and more of a twist around into a different form if that makes Mm -hmm. any sense Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and for like his head to essentially still be his head in both modes if they're going to do that on anybody it's good (laughs) that they did it on an insecticon yeah yeah you're right I had the toy as a kid, and I remember thinking he was really cool looking. It bummed me out that he couldn't bend at the elbow because if he did that, the the other lower part of his arm would be off kilter because of the oh, way yep. the arm splits. And then I also love the fact that you've got these two Insecticons who are profoundly weird and complex and really kind of like a bunch of arbitrary things sort of smushed together to equal these weird things. And then you got like the dumb guy. He's like, he's not as, he's not as clever as the other two, but... And, and, he, and what's more is he makes really bad jokes. You know, he's, he's just, he's like 60 pounds of dad jokes. Yeah. And and he really doesn't drive any narratives. He's, he's mm-hmm. along for the ride, right? Yes. He's like, where, where you guys go, I go. I'm, I'm cool. That's, that's mm-hmm. fine. So. It would be interesting to craft a story where something draws kickback out from mm-hmm. the team. Like, is there something out there that could possibly shake kickback out of his complacency Mm -hmm. you know is it is Mm -hmm. it maybe like a giant meal you know (laughs) (laughs) i don't know what it would be but it would be an interesting story to go down you know to sort of pull out something from his character that we haven't had the opportunity to see yeah that is an interesting idea like how do you get this guy to be less inert Mm -hmm. yeah what could we give him that would actually motivate him yeah and and finding out what's the secret behind all that, right? Well, yeah. maybe he, he tried something once, and there's a tragic story behind that. Mm, and so yeah. he learned, like, don't reach for the stars, kid. Just be happy with what you got, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, of course, <laughs> we probably just read into kickback more than anyone <laughs> has ever read into kickback. But uh, <laughs> but that's what we do here. And, and if we really wanted to write the story tightly, there would be a reason why his name is called Kickback. Okay, there was something to do with some kind of like Cybertronian mafia. You know, he was involved mm-hmm. in some kind of money laundering thing, or he was a law enforcement Autobot at some point, right? And then like he, <laughs> he was he was taking bribes. You know, something. No, no. See, the 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 joy of Kickback is that he is simple. 
<laughs> I see. He kicks people, so he's <laughs> going to take the name Kickback. There's no, there's no convoluted backstory to him. He's <laughs> he's on the surface. He was what raised by a Wookiee, and she always messed up his hair and told him that he looked <laughs> better scruffy looking, and so he hates it when you call him scruffy looking. <laughs> No, these are not <laughs> Star Wars novels. <laughs> oh, but yes, I love Kickback for who he is. Yeah, yeah, and and and, and a, a rounded team should have this guy, right? Yeah. So moving on to the Constructicons, let us start with Scrapper, the semi leader? Question mark of them. Right! No one drives us, stupid human! We are the Constructicons! We drive ourselves! Yeah, and weird, right? Because he's like a leg. So you'd assume that like mm-hmm. uh, things like Voltron have taught us that the head is the leader. Yeah. But, but he clearly at least is presented as being somewhat in charge of this team. Megatron addresses him directly. Scrapper's weird so far in the cartoon because we really don't have a sense of who he is yet because we're getting so many different interpretations. Yeah. I like Megatron. That's all we know about him so far. I got <laughs> up this morning. I thought Megatron's pretty great, right? Yeah, let's let's go. Let's build some stuff, and I'll bicker with you a little bit. That's <laughs> Michael Bell gives great performances in all of his iterations, but it's like at, up at, at this point in the journey through the series, he's given us different performances every time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, his scrapper has not been consistent. The only sort of consistency we can really see is that he seems to be the boss of the Constructicons, although sometimes it seems like Hook is more of the boss. Mm-hmm. But maybe that's sort of a give-and-take scenario, like I just said with the Insecticons. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as far as character-wise, I can't really say much about him other than he's, you know, he bosses the other Constructicons around at times. That's really all we've really gotten. Yeah. We don't get a sense of his favorite color, favorite song, or what he likes to do on weekdays. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's a right. scrapper. He likes to build stuff and then yell at his uh, fellow Constructicons and then tell yeah. Megatron he's great, so... <laughs> I like that he has a little Optimus Prime mouth. Not a lot of the other characters have it, that little mask. Mm-hmm. So that always stood out to me. But other than that, in the color scheme of all the Constructicons, which I love, yeah, not much. Th- I had him. I had a couple Constructicons, and Scrapper was one of them. Mm. I did get the Devastator gift set for, I don't know well. if it was Christmas or a birthday. It was probably one of those. But yeah, getting that gift set, with all six of them was really cool for the time. Even though the toy was so small. I mean, Devastator combined was smaller than Shockwave. So I think that was my start to really being upset with the scale of Transformer toys. Mm. When, you know, the quote-unquote largest weapon in the Decepticon arsenal was even shorter than Shockwave was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, much less special. Yeah. So what about Scavenger? Scrapper, I'm picking up computer signals from above. We're directly under Teletran 1. Scavenger, again, I don't feel we've gotten a good grasp on him yet. His voice is interesting in that he seems to be a bit of a a go-getter. Like, you know, he's not like Kickback. He's not just kind of like there. He seems to be actively doing things and part of the team. We did get that weird moment in the core where he like says he's had a good time with the rest yeah. of the team. Yeah. Yeah. Where the, he thinks he, they might all die soon. So he like actually thanks the rest of the guys for... I feel like he's Teddy from Bob's Burgers. Mm. He's, like, he's, like, he's like the construction guy with a heart. Yeah. That may be a good comparison there. But yeah, we just haven't really seen him shine individually. And honestly, I don't think we ever will if yeah. memory serves. Yeah. I don't think he has many lines coming up. But yeah, I, I had the toy. I thought he was really cool looking in both modes. I mean, in Heavy Metal War, he has that one little bit where he kind of like is talking excitedly. And I felt like, okay, so he's like the guy who's like easily flummoxed. Mm. But that's, that's, a, that's a big jump from like two lines. Yeah. Bone Crusher, I did not have. Remove the debris, long haul. Nothing about this guy ever jumped out at me. Yeah, he's brash, 
you know, he's kind of always just like talking like this, you know, he's like, Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, kind of generic. They had a problem. They had six characters debut at once. So honestly, you got to cut him some slack. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But we never get a sense of his character as opposed to other Constructicons. Mm. It just seems like he's he's angrier, he's <laughs> gruffer, and that's basically all there is to him. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to Long Haul. Remove! Remove! Always remove! I didn't join this outfit to be a dump truck! One of the first things out of his mouth... Is like, you know, remove, remove, always remove. I didn't join this outfit to be a dump truck. Yeah. You know, he's complaining. It's almost like he was like, oh, uh, join up with this team. I'll, I'm going to do amazing things. And it's like, okay, you transform into a dump truck. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. You know? So it feels like he wanted much better for himself, didn't get it. But this is still his ticket it's sort of his ticket to ride, you know, so far it hasn't really worked out pretty well, but he doesn't see any other better options for him. Like, like I'm, I'm still a low rung in the totem pole at this point, but you know, maybe someday, maybe they're going to promote me and maybe I'll have more to do. (laughs) But he, but he's such a sour sack that nobody wants to be around him. Yeah. 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 Like he views this team or whatever as his, best shot at getting promoted but the fact that he's complaining about doing everything isn't going to get him promoted so it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy Mm -hmm. but all he ever thinks about is like if only i could be one of those tapes oh (laughs) snug in soundwave's chest high-fiving rumble on the weekends man those tapes got it made (laughs) if only megatron would look at me the way he looks at laser beak (laughs) So I do like it when Long Haul shows up because I, yeah. I am really fond of complainers. Yeah. Typically not in real life, but as far as <laughs> animated characters go, I love Well, them. again, this is a safe world, right? It's, it's pretend. True, true. Hook. Of course I did it. I can perform flawlessly to within one five hundred thousandth of a Cybertronic mini-inch. Hook, who is like arrogant political pundit as <laughs> sadistic artist, right? Yeah, yeah, you've used that phrase before, and that that fits him perfectly. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that on a team of villains, we didn't have that yet. Yeah. You know, we didn't have the sort of sick-minded guy who's super intelligent and is happy to tell people how intelligent he is. And, you know, it's like, uh, you know, that's such a villain stereotype almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Especially it's, it's... like for comic booky villains, like, oh, I'm so intelligent and so on. You know, and Starscream is kind of like that to a degree, mm-hmm. but Starscream's also shown to be wrong a lot of the times. So it comes off differently. Yeah. Starscream's also easy to rile up and melt, and he melts mm-hmm. down, whereas like Hook is kind of unflappable. I think mm-hmm. that's part of, part of the deal with him. He's the picture of Dorian Gray. He's like the, the debonair, the Prince of Darkness is, is a gentleman kind of character. Mm-hmm. Starscream is arrogant, but Hook is very intelligently arrogant. If that's He's self-assured, yeah. Self-assured, yeah. Yeah, and, and he's, you're right. He, he brings something to the group that gets explored a little bit here and there. So he's like a little bit more interesting than, say, Bone Crusher. Mm-hmm. But the one who was my favorite was Mixmaster. I'll glue it shut with quickset silicone. Long haul, load those chemicals into my mixing drum. When I was a kid. <laughs> and why? Because he's crazy, you know? Like, as a kid, it's like, that's just give me that. Just give me a guy who's kind of wild. Wild in the eyes and, like, oh, the, the repeats words a little bit, and I'll get excited. And mm-hmm. I thought, like, what a non-interesting thing to turn into, a, a cement mixer. And then I read the file card, I'm like, oh, wait, he's like a chemical factory. That's actually pretty cool, you know? Yeah. You know, especially because they've established, like, like Ironhide can make liquid nitrogen inside him and everything. And so here's this Decepticon whose, quote-unquote, sole purpose is to mix stuff. Mm-hmm. And as we've seen, he can even do weird things like Skywarp can <laughs> shove oh shove cars into his mixing drum and out come steel beams. So <laughs> that's ridiculous. 
Yeah. But <laughs> as far as a villain character goes, it's pretty. It's a pretty neat thing to be able to do. Mm. So it's neat to see a quote unquote crazy character be almost like crazy like a fox as they say because it is clear that he knows what he's doing Mm -hmm. you know he's doing the job well when scavenger messes up in the core you know it's mix master who has to take him to the surface and identify his whatever crazy terminology they gave it and figure out what went wrong so mix master is obviously good at what he does and that usually isn't mixed with a crazy character. You know, you mm-hmm. had a crazy character in TFA in Blitzwing, but Blitzwing was okay. But I didn't get the sense that Blitzwing was a master of anything, you know? <laughs> yeah. Whereas Mixmaster, I mean, it's in his name, Mixmaster. Yeah. You know, he does a good job. He is the guy to go to for chemical stuff Mm -hmm. you know that is his forte and he does it well he may seem like a nut job but he's a nut job who knows his stuff yeah i I have a lot of fondness for this kind of character in fiction the the character whose level of mastery is so high that they've excluded a bunch of other like normal skills that everybody else should everybody else has like how to be how to be a person you know yeah They can come off as aggressive, weird, or, you know, making people feel uncomfortable, but, like, there's no denying the fact that they have boundless knowledge in this one arena where they've devoted themselves. That's a Mm -hmm. fun kind of character that I I like in fiction. So Mixmaster's kind of heading in that direction. Getting a little bit of different interpretations based on who's writing the episode, but we can infer at least that much from the different iterations we've gotten, so... Yeah, and like I said, I just I love the color scheme of the constructed cons. I love that we get some like bright green bad guys <laughs> in the team. <laughs> so that's the constructed cons. I guess we should take a second to talk about Devastator. Prepare to meet your doom. Nothing can withstand the might of Devastator. Mm. Again, we haven't really gotten the sense of Devastator yet, other than he talks in the third person, which I think is pretty neat, because in a way, if you think about it, it could be like the six Constructicons talking about this other guy they make up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense for a Gestalt combiner guy to refer to himself in the third person, and if you look at it a certain way. Sure. And he, you know, he's just sort of portrayed as an all powerful guy. We had that bit in the core where he actually got into sort of a discussion with Chip, like, wrong, Megatron is doing this, you know. So Mm -hmm. clearly he's not just a brute. He's definitely shown to have at least a modicum of intelligence. He's definitely not just your typical brute that you send to the good guys to wipe them out. He has a bit of intelligence, you know, and Mm -hmm. that's because he's built of these individual characters who do have some intelligence. So that's, it's a good mix. I think if you're creating the first huge Decepticon, I would kind of think your goal is, well, he's big and you know, everything else falls by the wayside. So maybe he's dumb, that sort Mm -hmm. of stereotype, the big dumb guy, but devastator is not that. He's not super intelligent by any means, but he's not the dummy. So Mm -hmm. he's just a big guy and a weapon that Megatron loves to use against the Autobots. Plus Arthur Burkhart voicing him. Yeah, can't can't ever argue against Arthur Burkhart's participation in anything. He sounds (laughs) great. (laughs) He really does. (laughs) All right, so now we got to talk about one of your favorite characters, the guy (laughs) who is so despicably loyal. (laughs) <laughs> that he stayed by the phone for four million years. <laughs> you must be referring to the military operations commander, Shockwave. Fear not, Megatron. Cybertron shall remain as you leave it. Yep. Now, it is no secret if you've listened to these episodes that I love Shockwave. I love a guy who seems very happy in his post. He's essentially second in command as far as, you know, the rest of Cybertron goes. When Megatron leaves the planet, he says, Shockwave, you're in charge here. You know, Mm -hmm. you're running the show. 
And, you know, maybe that's because all the other guys we see left on Cybertron are like weird drone guys and like Deceptitran and, <laughs> and yeah. other weirdos like that. Maybe Shockwave's just <laughs> the best of a bunch of guys who aren't very good. Who knows? But in my head, Kenan, at least, Shockwave is a very great second banana. He would not be good in a leadership position but he's great in a secondary position. In a lot of ways, I think that's sort of been me in the past in some of the Mm. retail jobs that I used to have. Mm -hmm. I never minded being in charge as long as it was a temporary thing and someone else was the actual boss. But you you loved being head of ops. Yeah, yeah, just like... You know, give me something to look over, to reign over, and I'll be fine. You know, as long as I'm not making all the huge decisions. As long as I can pass that buck off, I'm good. I mean, Shockwave is a little different in that he was in charge of an entire planet. But, you know, we haven't seen much that was going on on Cybertron. So it's kind of... (laughs) It's almost like you were the manager of a store in a mall that doesn't get any crowds. Mm. So it's like... You know, you can you can handle a planet when it's not a hustly bustly kind of place. But as we've seen, the minute a couple Dinobots come walking through his elevator shaft, he kind of loses it. He's not used to this sort of activity. <laughs> <laughs> so Shockwave's a good commander as long as not much is happening. Yeah. You know, it's like I can entrust Cybertron to you because we've pretty much beaten the Autobots into submission. So I can let you handle things now, Shockwave. I had the toy. I thought it was great. They made his animation model look a lot like the toy, which I really appreciate because sometimes we didn't always get that in Mm -hmm. Generation 1. Braun, Braun. I didn't like how big he was, as I just said. but, But yeah, I think I love Shockwave's loyalty. I love the fact that he's just there to do a good job for Megatron. Mm. I really like it. You know, I've... I read the comics as a kid. I didn't like Shockwave as a, well, logic dictates I'm going to be the leader. Eh, it just wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> I like yeah. Shockwave as a loyalist. I really appreciate him that way. And he is sort of weird in that he has, like, one eye and no mouth. You know, visually, he's sort of strange. Mm-hmm. And he's purple. So yeah. I got to give him that. <laughs> you got the purple and silver and Corey Burton's performance with the. Yes, you know, yes, definitely. I love that for sure. He seems like, well, you, you put that tone of voice and he comes across as being the, the most educated and classy of all the Decepticons, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And you couple that with this blind, selfless loyalty towards Megatron. And it's, it's a weird mix. Right, he mm-hmm. he should be smarter than that, and also the earnestness that he gives in his performance sometimes. Where like in Countdown to Extinction, Starscream's like, "Well, why don't you look Megatron up on the phone if you don't think he's dead?" It's like, "Well, I I can't, but I assure you, I will keep trying." You know. <laughs> yeah. What's really interesting is that Shockwave's good at his job until things surprise him, <laughs> and then. Yeah then you can't really guarantee that you're going to get a good job <laughs> out of Shockwave. So yeah. I identify a lot with that, and maybe that makes my love for the character stronger. Yeah. Yeah, he's 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 like a really solid number two, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And I, I mean, I think that a lot of the characters that you wind up expressing a lot of affection for tend to fall, have those characteristics about them, be like a really strong number two, a really, somebody you can count on that, that like they're, commitment never falters right Mm -hmm. yep a lot of the decepticons they're committed up to a point skywarp is like as as long as megatron is scary yes i'm here you Mm -hmm. know thundercracker is like as long as it's not too hard yeah i'm here (laughs) yeah you know but the shockwave is like no i will wait four million years and you know you don't have to call me i will be here you know like that (laughs) that is a resilient love (laughs) if if ever there was one (laughs) Yeah, the phrase, set it and forget it, it comes to mind (laughs) with Shockwave. Shockwave, I leave Cybertron to you. Four million years later, he's still running things. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. 
So, yeah, and I think we'll see this with some other characters coming up later on in the series that you're, you're going to hear Hoover get like just as effusive in his affection for that character. <laughs> Why? Because they don't deviate from their adoration for their leader. <laughs> I do think it's interesting that like he's got this David Warner impersonation for the character. And David Warner's characters are always very sophisticated, clever villains. And so you hear mm -hmm. that voice, so you think, okay, he's definitely going to have like a sub-scheme. No! He, no, he doesn't. <laughs> wow. So, again, pointing to this arbitrary mix of elements in a lot of the early Transformers characters and stories that I think make it, generally speaking, more imaginative of, of other things we had seen before. They, they don't do the obvious thing a lot with these characters. So who knows how much of that was calculated and how much of that was just like a lot of cooks in the kitchen, but it came mm -hmm. together really great. So Yeah. So... That just leaves one little guy. He's a pretty <laughs> unimportant guy that we never see very much. Uh -huh. Just kidding. It's Megatron. We see him all the time. I am Megatron Skyfire, supreme leader of all Decepticons. We are on this planet to collect the energy we need to revive Cybertron and conquer the universe. And the Autobots are now our enemies. Now, I feel like this is like you asking me about Bumblebee. I just need to like sort of like <laughs> just say Megatron go because I, I don't I like the character. I don't have like a ton of affection for the character. He's he's fine. You know, he's not he's not as interesting to be as like Starscream or some of the others. But so go. What do you what do you love about Megatron? <laughs> well, I love him. He is <laughs> smart. He's always got something in his back pocket that the Autobots can't even conceptualize of sometimes literally like he pulls out a weird weapon or whatever, or <laughs> invisibility spray, spray yeah. or yeah. whatever he's tactically, he is a great leader, not the perfect leader, but a very great leader. And he's got like all the best qualities of your cartoon villain. And that may not have been possible if not for Frank Welker. You know, you look at a lot of other cartoons from this time period, like look at Centurions, look at GoBots, and the villains are okay. They're just sort of typical, but there's just not that X factor that has you really glom onto the character. Megatron has that in spades. Mm. Just the delivery of certain lines. I mean, if you just want to like listen to any of the Transformer book and record sets or read the coloring books. Like that's a very bland interpretation of villainy and Megatron. But Frank Welker brings really something special to the mix. You get that snideness that him, him talking down to prime. Did you really think you were going <laughs> to get, you know, one up on me? You know, and, and he just runs the gamut through emotions, like when he's just had it with the fact that, that like, Gears' personality has become loving and, and just, like, will do anything for you. Yeah. He's just like, Ugh. <laughs> you know, he, he just really runs us through those emotions. And, and, of course, rage, I would say, is Megatron's number one emotion. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. You know, he's always angry and he's always yelling his head off. There's none of that in Mask. You know, these other cartoons that were around at the same time, they all pale in comparison. And maybe we want to go back even further than Frank Welker and point to Wally Burr being such a good voice director maybe Frank Welker would have given a more bland performance if not for Wally Burr. You know, mm -hmm. who knows? So I, I certainly give them both credit. Definitely, I would say the Sunbow shows would have not been nearly as good as they were without Wally Burr. Clearly, it shows, you know, you put up, you watch an episode of G.I. Joe and you watch an episode of Mask. You know, you watch <laughs> those two back to back and you're going to see the difference. You're going to hear the difference, I should say. I've had just about enough of your mask bashing, mister. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, Megatron is a great character. He could have easily fallen in the generic villain type of hole that a lot of these characters do fall into. Mm -hmm. But he didn't because I think Frank Welker saved him from that. 
Yeah. And I think once Frank Welker sort of got the voice for him, you know, that influenced script writers to sort of, you know, take it in new ways. And I would even say, like, for the movie, had Frank Welker's performance not been known at that point, you know, I think Megatron's portrayal in a lot of these scripts would have, you know, come off a little more bland. Mm. But, you know, Megatron always knows what he's doing. He always has, you know, something in his back pocket to spring on the Autobots when they last realize it. You know, he's he's just always in charge. And that's a great villain. That is a fantastic voice to hear all the time. I can't say enough about him. So... <laughs> See, to me, he seems like so teed up to be such an unlikely mega popular villain. When you really look at his design, it's like, what's his color scheme? Well, he's gray. Mm -hmm. We'll put a little bit of red on him. Fine. There you go. Like, okay. What does he turn into? Well, he turns into a pistol. What? Mm -hmm. Really? You know, well, don't worry. His, other, his, his soldiers will, will use him as a gun. Okay. That's weird. You know, it's like, there's just like so many odd things that just make me say like, he is not menacing. But then when you're right, when you hear Frank Walker's portrayal, he, mm -hmm. especially his rage, I think of the, the scene when, when Mirage is jumping out of the Decepticon ship before it crashes and Megatron just says, stop him! Mm -hmm. You know, it's, yeah. it's uh, what I just did is, you know, like an ant to a gorilla in terms of strength. Right. Yeah. It's just moments like that that just make this character who could have been pretty bland and, and weird and boring. Mm -hmm. And honestly, he kind of was in the comic. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, as far as his animation version, spot on. I mean, yeah, it's weird that he turns into a gun and everything, and that's that's a whole other, the whole Microman versus Diaclone thing. You know that that could be a whole episode in itself. But yeah, but as Megatron was this toy, so they brought that toy to life in I feel the best way. Yeah, they did a good job. You already know my Megatron sad tale, where I never had him as a kid. Uh, I was like. I was like 24 or 25, maybe even older by the time I got him. That was a long, long time coming when I finally got to hold in my hands a Megatron toy. So there we go. There's mm -hmm. our la one last look at the Generation 1, Season 1 Decepticons before the army starts growing. How much is it going to grow by <laughs> in the next rest of the season, Hoover? Well, 15 more Decepticons are coming Whoa. in the rest of Season 2. So, Holy cow. Yeah. There's 21 right now. 21 if you count Reflector as one and not three. Okay. <laughs> so for 15 more to show up, that's, that's kind of a lot. Yeah. That's, that's so, a big, big growth spurt. Yeah. So that's why we wanted to talk about these people before they start getting crowded out. <laughs> mm. And of course, you know, Soundwave, Megatron and Starscream, you know, they're going to be around a lot. Mm -hmm. We're not going to lose sight of those guys. But some of these others are going to fade into the background a little bit more. So we just wanted a chance to touch on them. So next week we go back to watching episodes mm -hmm. and talking about them. So what episode are we taking on next week? Next week is a prime problem. Ah, this one I have not so great memories of. I have a few chips on my shoulder in thinking about what the plot is, but that might mean that I show up and watch it again and go like, hey, it's actually way better than I thought it was. Mm -hmm. That has definitely happened in the past. Yeah. Also, yeah, I would say the same thing. I don't remember liking it that much as a kid. Yeah. I uh, don't have a lot of memories of it, but I remember just going, mm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember watching it as a kid and feeling like it kind of validated a lot of 80s sentiment in terms of, oh, do you want to be a hero? Well, be strong and be really good at physical things. And for <laughs> a timid art kid, that was not a message that was well received. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that sucks. I got to go work out. And I hate doing that. <laughs> So that'll be us next week back on back on task, back on the episodes. So join us then. All right. Thank you, Hoover, for this discussion this week and every week. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of four million years later dot com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been Hoover. Okay, bye. Goodbye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas-mahalik. That's spelled 
N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>